Welcome to our micro-learning course about checklists in general aviation. Hopefully you have already completed modules 1 through 3. This bonus module is concerned solely with abnormal procedures checklists. It is not essential, but I recommend that you view the modules in sequence. All of the modules can be accessed through my website, genebenson.com. What is the difference between an emergency situation and an abnormal situation? I think intuitively we know the difference. An emergency initiates a biological sequence that results in soiled underwear. An abnormal situation causes a tightening of certain muscles closest to the seat in an attempt to grip the seat, thereby preventing, at least temporarily, soiled underwear. Or, I guess, leaving the biology and the lame attempt at comedy out, we could say this. An emergency is something that requires an immediate response, while an abnormal situation is something that requires analysis and possibly corrective action in the near term. Here are some examples to illustrate the difference between emergency situations and abnormal situations. Of course, these are not complete lists and individual items may not apply to every type of airplane. But I think we can agree that things like a fire or sudden engine failure would be emergencies. There are probably lists of emergencies and recommended procedures for dealing with them in the airplane flight manual or pilot's operating handbook. But a high oil temperature reading, an alternator dropping off line, or a door popping open aren't emergencies but are not normal. Therefore, we call them abnormal situations. There are basically two dangers inherent in abnormal situations. First, there is the distraction factor. Many, many accidents have been attributed to a distraction produced by an abnormal situation. And second, many abnormal situations can become emergencies or can lead directly to an accident if they are ignored or handled inappropriately. Of course, whether we have an emergency or an abnormal situation, we must make our first priority controlling the airplane. Then we can analyze the situation and take appropriate action, but we must fly the airplane regardless of what else is happening. That point cannot be stressed enough. We must make flying the airplane and maintaining control our biggest priority. And as we deal with whatever our situation is, we must not fixate on it at the expense of maintaining aircraft control. We must also maintain situational awareness regarding traffic, airspace, and other important considerations. We must shift our focus back and forth between flying the airplane and working the problem. If an autopilot can be used to help fly the airplane, that is fine, but we must still monitor the flight. So let's make sure we are clear on the difference between an emergency situation and an abnormal situation. Consider this scenario. You're making a takeoff in a single engine airplane from a relatively long runway. At an altitude of 50 feet, the engine suddenly seizes and the prop stops. Does this situation pose an immediate threat? Of course it does. So this is an emergency. Immediate action is required. Let's look at another scenario. You're in cruising flight in a single engine airplane when you notice that the alternator is not charging. An attempt to bring the alternator online is not successful. What should be your course of action? It may not pose an immediate threat if we are flying in Class G airspace, day, VFR, and an airplane that does not rely heavily on electrically operated systems such as a Piper Warrior. But at night, in an IFR conditions, this can cause problems rather quickly. So when addressing abnormal situations, we must consider the circumstances. Alternator failure is generally considered to be an abnormal procedure. But how we deal with it depends on the circumstances, so we must consider that when creating our abnormal procedures checklists. Airlines have detailed procedures for just about everything that might arise. This is an excerpt from my old Boeing 737 manual. The section shown deals with asymmetrical flaps. Note that the tabs are amber to denote caution. Emergency procedures had red tabs. Today these checklists are all electronic. Most newer airplanes have an abnormal procedures section in their manuals, but if you are among the vast majority of general aviation pilots, you are flying an airplane that does not include recommended abnormal procedures. So to create our own set of abnormal procedures, we will have to play a game of what if. What if my alternator drops offline? What if my electric flaps won't extend? What if I have an odor of something burning 
What if a cabin door pops open? Our game of what if must be done in the presence of adequate information about the kind of airplane we are flying. The same set of abnormals that will work for a Cessna 172 may not be applicable to a Cessna 210. And the abnormals for a Bonanza may not be applicable to a Malibu. This activity is best done with a small group of pilots who fly the same kind of airplane. The group would also ideally include a maintenance technician who is knowledgeable about that particular airplane and has access to maintenance manuals. The process can be done as a solo event, but it is essential to solicit feedback on the procedures from others before putting them into practice. Flawed abnormal procedures may be more dangerous than having no abnormal procedures at all. Here are a few examples of abnormal situations. Strong headwinds, increasing oil temperature, engine vibration, light structural icing, ammeter shows excessive load, or odor of something burning. Creating our own abnormals is a valuable learning experience. It has the added benefit of helping us learn more about the airplane systems. So finally, let's get specific. Let me tell you a story about an accident that happened a few years ago right near my house and then look at an abnormal procedures checklist item that might have prevented it. The airplane had a fuel system very similar to that of a Cessna 152 and that there are two fuel tanks located in the wings. But instead of fuel gauges on the panel, they are in the wing roots. The fuel selector is simple in that it has two positions, on and off. As long as it is in the on position and there is fuel in either tank, the engine will be fed. On a perfect sunny day in July, my wife came back from town and asked me if I knew that there was an airplane in the ditch. I did not know there was an airplane in the ditch, so I rushed over. I found the airplane as you see it here, with two elderly gentlemen sitting on the ground holding their heads. They each had a small laceration on their forehead, but were otherwise unhurt. This is a Microsoft Flight Simulator view of the airport. The flight had departed about one hour earlier from a different private airport about 20 miles west. The men were just enjoying some flying on a near-perfect day. The pilot and aircraft owner glanced up at the fuel gauges and noted that the left tank indicated empty. They had departed with full fuel tanks and should be about three-quarter mark on both tanks. He believed that he had a fuel problem and decided to make a precautionary landing at the small airport. He had landed at the airport several times in the past. He decided to land on runway 18 even though there was a slight tailwind. A fairly busy highway lies just off the departure end of the runway. Utility wires run along the side of the road. The ditch where the airplane ended up also runs along the side of the road. As the pilot made his approach, he realized that he was too high. He elected not to execute a go-around because he feared losing power and striking the wires. He touched down with only a couple of hundred feet of runway remaining and ran off the end of the runway and into the ditch. The fuel quantity was about three quarters in each tank, just as it should have been. The problem was only with the indicator. Had this pilot been more aware of the operation of his fuel system, or thought through the scenario before, this accident might not have happened. So let's see what an abnormal procedures checklist might include for this situation. The blocks on the left describe the airplane and the situation. Our checklist item might read, fuel gauge unexpectedly indicates empty. I prefer the action indication action method, but whatever works for you is fine. Our first action might be check the reading on the other fuel gauge. If the indication is that the other fuel gauge reads empty or near empty, then we might very well have a problem, so our action should be to immediately divert to the nearest suitable airport. But if the indication on the other fuel gauge shows sufficient expected fuel quantity, the next action is to check for any visible signs of a fuel leak. Of course, we would look for the telltale blue streak if we are using 100 low lead avgas, or any signs of a visible liquid streaming away. If the indication is evidence of a fuel leak, then the action is to immediately divert to the nearest suitable airport. But if there is no evidence of leak, 
then the action is to verify time in flight. And if I may digress for just a moment, let me stress that we should always write down the time of our takeoff. I think many fuel exhaustion accidents could be prevented if pilots noted the exact takeoff time and referred to it periodically to determine how long they have been flying. Anyway, back to our procedure. If the indication is that the time in flight is consistent with the other fuel gauge reading, our action might be to continue on course and monitor the situation. It also tells us to increase our fuel reserve requirement and closely monitor the fuel quantity on the operating fuel gauge. Here's another scenario. You are in cruising flight in a single engine airplane when you notice that the circuit breaker for the strobe lights has been tripped. What should be your course of action? Let's summarize the situation. You are on a night VFR cross-country flight when you notice that the strobe lights are not operating and that the associated circuit breaker has tripped. Here is a possibility of an abnormal procedure for this situation. Note that we are not going to write a procedure for each circuit breaker, but a procedure that will cover all of our circuit breakers. Remember, this isn't the only way to do it. You will determine what works best for you and your comfort level. So, our first action is to identify which breaker has tripped. Our indication causes us to decide if it is essential or not for our operation. The action for a non-essential circuit breaker is to leave it popped and continue on, but to evaluate our future needs. If the circuit breaker is essential, then the action tells us to wait at least a minute and attempt to reset if there is no smoke or burning smell. If the indication after a reset is that the circuit breaker does not trip, then the action is to continue, but monitor. If the indication is another trip, then we are instructed not to reset it again, plan for a landing, and review what equipment will be inoperative and how we will deal with that situation. Again, this isn't the only way to proceed, but it is one idea that you can work within your comfort level to come up with procedures that work for you and the kind of airplane you are flying. Here is a related but different scenario. You are on a night VFR cross-country flight when you notice that the alternator is offline. You would, of course, notice this by seeing a negative reading on an ammeter or a zero reading on a load meter. And by the way, it is important to scan the engine and system instruments frequently. Some pilots don't look at those instruments from the time they do the run-up prior to takeoff till, well, they do the next run-up prior to the next takeoff. The sooner a problem is recognized, the more likely it can be dealt with successfully. Again, I'm not saying that this is the correct way to proceed. This is what I would do based on my experience. Our action is to check the circuit breakers. If our indication is that the breaker has tripped, our action might be to reset and monitor. If the resulting indication is that the alternator remains online, our action is to continue the flight and monitor. But if the indication is that the breaker trips again, then our action might be to reduce the electrical load to the essential equipment and then make some further decisions. Our next action is to identify the flight condition. If the indication is day VFR and ATC communication is required, our action might be to continue on course and notify ATC of our situation. We might also consider going to an alternate airport if our en route time is greater than 30 minutes. If our indication is that our flight is day VFR with no ATC communication required, then our action might be to continue on course and consider an alternate airport if the en route time to our destination is greater than one hour. But if our indication is that we are night VFR, then our action might be to divert to the nearest suitable airport. Finally, if our indication is that we are IFR, we might list our action as to declare an emergency and divert to the nearest suitable airport. Since our example airplane has electrically operated flaps, we have a note at the bottom to be prepared for a no flap landing. Of course, that might mean that we would divert to an airport with a longer runway. If our airplane had electrically operated landing gear, we would have to address that as part of our abnormal procedures. Let's take a look at an IFR situation. You are on a night IFR cross-country flight when you notice that the pitot static instruments are not behaving as expected. Now, perhaps this would best be considered as an emergency if in the clouds at night, but we will treat it here as an abnormal situation. Our action is to turn on the pitot heat and open the alternate static port. If our indication is that the system returns to normal, 
Our action is then to evaluate possible icing condition and consider landing at the nearest suitable airport. The logic here is that if the pitot tube and or static ports are icing, the rest of the airplane is probably growing ice also. Note that our action doesn't say to land at the nearest suitable airport, but only to consider it. But if the altimeter and vertical speed indicator return to normal, but the airspeed indicator is inaccurate, then, thinking back to ground school, the problem is most likely with a blocked pitot tube, and the action is to refer to that section in our abnormal procedures. Conversely, if the airspeed indicator returns to normal, but the altimeter and VSI are okay, then the problem is a blockage of the normal static system, and we are instructed to refer to that section. In a related scenario, we're on a cross-country flight when you notice that the airspeed indicator is not behaving as expected. Recall that one of the actions in the previous scenario was to refer to this procedure. Our action is to check the outside air temperature. If the indication is that the OAT is below freezing, the associated action is to activate the pitot heat. That is, followed immediately with another action, which is to evaluate possible icing conditions and consider landing at the nearest suitable airport. We aren't waiting to see if the pitot heat clears up the situation because it might take several minutes and the airplane can grow significant ice in that amount of time. We are assuming, by the way, that the airplane is not certified for flight in known icing conditions. So the assumption is that if the pitot tube is growing ice, we shouldn't be flying whether or not the airspeed indicator turns to normal. There is a note that advises us that we may have to land without an accurate airspeed indication. Then the procedure goes on to address what to do if the indication shows that the airspeed indicator returns to normal. The action is to warn us that icing conditions are present and that perhaps we should take appropriate action. So now that we understand the value of having an abnormal procedures checklist, let's see in a little more detail how we might build our own. Remember that this is a training exercise only. An actual usable abnormal procedures checklist is developed for a specific airplane and can also be built to accommodate the comfort level of a particular pilot. In our example, we will use a hypothetical single engine airplane, the Pigeon Hawk 2000. We need to make note of a couple of things before we begin. This is serious business and not something that we want to make unfounded assumptions about. We must use all available sources of information, including the airplane flight manual and maintenance manual, advice from aircraft maintenance professionals, and input from other pilots. Sometimes aircraft type groups will already have done all that or much of the work of creating abnormal procedures checklists, so we should find out if there is a type group for the kind of airplane we are flying and join it if it exists. Once we have either found a procedure created by someone other than the aircraft manufacturer or we have created one of our own, we must seek the counsel of other pilots and or maintenance professionals. Any procedure not created by the aircraft manufacturer should be thoroughly vetted before being adopted for use. Procedures will be built individually and then collated into an abnormal procedures checklist. So let's take a look at how we can go about building an abnormal procedure. We will use a procedure that we have already discussed, the blocked pitot tube. Step number one is to identify and clearly label the condition. This is not always as easy as it may seem. An inexperienced pilot may not be aware that unexpected behavior of the airspeed indicator is a symptom of a blocked pitot tube. This is one reason that we all use all of our resources and talk with other pilots while developing our procedures. We don't know what we don't know, so we may not realize which procedures we need to create. The second step is to thoroughly study the appropriate aircraft systems to understand how they work. In the case of the pitot static system, it will be learned, if not already known, that the airspeed indicator is connected to both the pitot tube for ram air pressure and to the static source for the undisturbed air pressure. The airspeed indicator measures the difference between the pitot pressure and the static pressure and reports the difference as airspeed. It will also be learned that no other instrument is connected to the pitot tube, so no other instrument will be affected by a blocked pitot tube. The next step is to research the impact that this condition will have on the flight. Is this truly an abnormal situation, or is it severe enough that it should be treated as an emergency? Assuming we decide that it is in fact an abnormal situation, 
then we must assess possible causes of the condition and whether there is a possibility that we can resolve the problem. In the case of the blocked pedot tube, we learn that the most common causes of blockage are insect nests or structural icing. Next, we must assess the impact that the condition will have on the flight and whether the impact will be different for the flight conditions such as day, night, VFR, or IFR. In the case of the black pedo tube, the impact of the abnormal situation is relatively the same regardless of our flight condition, so we can proceed with creating the procedure to be followed. Now we determine from our research that if the blockage is caused by insects, there is nothing we can do to correct the situation during flight. So we begin by determining if there is a possibility of ice causing the problem. We begin by checking the outside air temperature. If the temperature is near or below freezing, we will specify that we should activate the pitot heat. We already discussed the reasons for the rest of the creation of this procedure. Much of the information used to create the procedure can be obtained by discussion with other pilots and flight instructors. You have completed the bonus module on the Abnormal Procedures Checklist. Links to all modules plus more aviation safety videos can be found on my website, genebenson.com.